few more. It looks like some folks are kind of joining in right now anyway, so that's good. Okay, so um, I'd like to say hello to everybody and welcome you on behalf of Iowa OER. And I'm glad you've joined us today to learn more about um, open educational resources and kind of a particular case study of how they're being used in the state. Um, for those of you who are new um, or who haven't, you know, come on to this webinar before, um, our, our Iowa OER group has, um, has been pretty active in the recent year or so. And we have, I've dropped some links into the chat from our group. Um, you could join our Google group, which is kind of a mailing list that we send out, you know, updates that we find out about pertaining to OER across the state. There's also our website too that has a lot of resources that have been kind of called together to help people get started on OER projects. So if you have topics of interest, um, regardless of if you're new or if, or if this is uh, you know, something that you've attended before, feel free to, to send us an email through our listserv or through the, through the website for, for topics that you'd like to talk about. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Mariah Burnett and I'm a scholarly communications librarian at the University of Iowa. And I'm happy today to be joined by Frank O'Neill, who has been a biology and sports medicine instructor at Western Iowa Tech Community College since 2007. He's also an adjunct, adjunct online instructor at several other schools in Iowa. Uh, he's been the recipient of multiple teaching awards, including Western Iowa Tech's Outstanding Teacher of the Year in 2013 and 2020, the ICCOC E11 Excellence in Online Instruction Award in 2019, and the National Institute for Staff and Organizational Development Excellence Award in 2014 and 2019. He's passionate about curating it and creating resources that empower and engages students. And he writes on these topics at www.onlineteacheruniversity.com. And so I've, I've put that link in the chat too, so that you can take a look at that after the webinar. He resides in Sioux Falls, South Dakota with his wife, three children, dog Ruby and hamster Rosie. So today, Frank will talk about his own OER journey from realizing the need for open educational resources to effectively finding and curating OER to developing the necessary relationships and partnerships to make projects like this successful. So we'll keep our try to keep our microphones muted um, throughout the session until the question period. But if you have questions or comments or anything that you want to address right away, feel free to type those into the chat and I can kind of moderate them and and bring them up as the discussion moves forward. Um, so the other thing I wanted to let you know is that the whole session is being recorded so that we can post it on our website and to YouTube and share out for folks who can't attend in person. So um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Frank. All right, thank you. I uh, just wanna make sure, do you see my PowerPoint presentation in full screen? I'm not used to not being the host. Everybody you can see it fine? Okay, good. It's just to kind of keep me on track, so. Yeah, I mainly want to share my personal experience and then you, and then you, I want to put my spin on OER and how I use it. So a few things I like to talk about or incorporate lots of videos. I incorporate videos in, in every way possible when it comes to teaching. And then also uh, hands-on activities and trying to find ways to make online courses especially, but even hybrid and face-to-face -face courses more immersive by having students do more activities. So those are two things that I really like to focus on is how to incorporate video and then especially in the online environment, how to make sure that students get um, as good of an experience as possible. So I, I, I want to start by just kind of my journey. So OER, OER has been around a long time, but it's only been probably three years since I started to incorporate any of it. I was very hesitant at first. I just, uh, I didn't think that there was, a, there was good enough quality. I knew I didn't have time to write an entire textbook and, and I couldn't find the resources that I needed to make the OER work at that time. But a few things have changed over the years. I think that the, uh, the resources that are available have improved. So I have more to work with when I'm first starting to, to build a course or change to OER. And then on the other end, I've been able to develop relationships that have allowed me to create new resources too. So I, I still make a lot of video resources, but, I, but I'm working with different partners on trying to make uh, some animations, some simulations. Uh, turn, you know, making activities out of some of these static resources that are available, and those are the things that I want to talk about. But, but why do I care so much about this? I, I think that it's super important that we do whatever we can to balance the educational experience with, with cost. So there are lots of ways to give students an, a wonderful educational experience, but many of them are just too expensive for the typical student, at least the typical community college student that I serve. Uh, you know, as far as the number of students we have that that are single parents or you know working full time, going to full school full time. So I, I I can't say that I always create the greatest resources out there, and I always give the students the greatest resources that are available. But I do try to give them 
the best experience I can while keeping cost in consideration. So I've had, I can talk about some results at the end, but I've had classes go from needing $500 worth of resources to under 20, and the students are getting a very comparable experience. So, those, that, so when I first think of open educational resources, the first thing I think of is cost. And I'll share some numbers later that I've been able to save uh, my students uh, six figures already. The other reason that I move to OER where, whenever possible is the flexibility. I, I love the fact that I, can, that I can create resources, I can take things out that I don't think are pertinent to the class that I'm teaching, I can add resources from, out, from other places to enhance the learning experience. So I just think the flexibility and then that, that balancing of cost with quality are the main reasons that I'm so interested in OER. And, and I, at the end of this session, I want to talk about some of the obstacles and hurdles that, that still exist there. Okay, Oop. it's not letting me change my slide. I can do it down here. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about as far as like finding resources versus creating resources, I always tell people, because I think that the amount of resources that I create scares people. So I tell them, you know, it isn't necessary. The, the reason I, I create more content than I need to, uh, partly because I just enjoy doing it and I can explain why I like to create so much content. But when I'm talking to someone that's starting, starting out, I like to remind them to curate content first. So look and see what's already available, find the best resources that already exist, and then you can fill in the gaps with the content that you create. So I put an image up, up here on the screen of some of the OpenStax books. Some of the OpenStax books, I, I've used the OpenStax Anatomy and Physiology books, biology books, microbiology books. I've even dipped into their chemistry and physics books for individual topics for my students. So OpenStax is where I always start now. If I'm, if I'm building a new course or I'm, I'm working on a new resource, I see what OpenStax has, and then, then I go from there. And you can also curate video content. There's, a, there's amazing video resources on the internet already. And then simulations, I'll show you some examples of some of the simulations that I found that people can freely use. So I think that whatever course, whatever topic you're teaching, the, the first thing is to curate and see what's out there. And I'll give you some ideas as to how I find new content. And it's one, the only good thing about how this year has changed is there's been a huge explosion of people sharing their resources on the internet, uh, social media, you know, Twitter, Facebook, just blowing up with, uh, with people that are giving away and sharing resources they've built. So, so in many ways, this year has been uh, the best time to find and curate resources. But then why do I make resources? So it, it, I really do believe that these OpenStax books are, are of uh, very high quality. But why do I make some of my own resources? Well, I think the instructor resources are still lacking in some of these areas. I've actually been working with OpenStax on that, trying to improve their instructor resources. And I know there are other, other providers out there. But I feel like there are, some, there are some areas where if a topic just isn't being covered well enough, then I need to find a way to make some materials to fill, to fill that gap. The other reason that I like to create so much contact, content has to do more with how I connect and engage with my students. I could very easily share videos, and I, and I used to do this until I slowly replaced them with my own. I could very easily share videos from, um, you know, Wendy Riggs from the um, HAPS uh, has amazing resources on the internet. You've got your crash courses, the Khan Academy. There's tons of resources out there that, that I could share. But the reason I like to create my own content is for the personal aspect. Basically, my students, I, I'm very heavy into video, so my students get to see and hear me every day when, when they're working on their content. So I like, I like the fact that I can create my own personal resources, but it's certainly not essential right away. If, if someone asks me where should I begin, wh whether I'm making videos or written content, anything that really adds that personal aspect. So I might have, I might have a course that has, has 130 videos in it, and, you, and you're not gonna start there. Excuse me, throat's kind of dry. But where should you start? the course introductions, the weekly introductions, things, things where your personal touch is really gonna be important to the students is where I recommend starting and creating those, those types of resources. So I've already mentioned the, you know, the flexibility, the fact that I can, so when I'm teaching a topic, I might have a single topic that I'm teaching out of three different OpenStax textbooks. Like the, microbi the microbiology textbook has some really good resources on cellular respiration and metabolism, but then I'll dip into the anatomy textbook or the biology textbook for a topic here or there. So I love that I can pull all this information together and organize it in a way where students can get the best of any resource that I can find. 
So I think that I think that kind of covers that topic well. If you if if anyone has any questions about how to start and where to start, then then I'd love to hear them at the end. We can have a conversation about that. But that's always been my policy: this idea of curating first, and then creating resources you need to. Now I'm at the point where I create resources that I want to, and that's totally fine. And I'm also totally fine with with people using my resources. I have uh, I have a couple dozen instructors that uh, that use use my teaching videos and use my resources, and uh, that's perfectly fine. That, that's why I put them out there, and we'll talk about how I share some of this stuff publicly as well. So building on creating resources, this is actually where I put all my YouTube videos. I, I've made I have three separate channels, and I've made hundreds of videos that no one gets to use. That's one of the benefits of open education resources. I made 449 teaching videos um, using Pearson's resources. Those were copyrighted resources. I was given written permission to create those resources as long as they were always locked in my courses. But now, since I rely on OpenStax resources and other things that are Creative Commons licensed. When I create resources, I can share them publicly. Why don't, you know, there's no ads, I'm not monetizing it, nothing like that at all. It's just if, if I'm gonna teach a topic, why not teach anyone, anyone that wants to learn rather than just my handful of students? So that's one nice thing. I spend as much time now creating resources as I used to, but now I can share them with a larger audience and help help more people. <coughs> I think, you know, that obviously, um, so I, and the other nice thing about that, since I do teach at multiple schools, I, you know, I, I always create resources in a way that allow me to share them uh, at, at different schools. And honestly, most of it's um, textbook agnostic. I create resources where no matter what textbook I use, the, you know, the topic, the topics will still fit. That's also why, you know, just as an aside, that's also why I create all my own resources on my own time, you know, at home with my own technology. I never want there to be any issues there with as far as ownership. And, and who owns any of the resources that I that I work with and I make. Uh, I just wanna share a few examples of ones that I found. I, I kinda tell, I'll tell you how I have found the resources that I use, but just some really good ones out there that would that are helpful only for people in my fields, but they still give you the idea of the type of things you can find. Um, here's an example. This is a extremely detailed, amazing uh, A&P, Anatomy and Physiology lab book that was created by the folks at Mount Hood Community College. So I take, I don't use the entire lab manual, but I take the labs and the images and things in this lab manual that I like, and then I build on top of them. So I might, I might create a lab report that goes along with something here. I've taken some of the images from these lab, from these lab manuals and turned them into fill in the blank quizzes and things like that. So I, so I found a really good resource. So rather than creating a lab manual from scratch, I found one. This is actually a three-parter. It's hundreds of pages. It's super in-depth. But I've, I start with what they have, and then I've, then I've decided, how can I turn this into assignments? Or how can I turn this into assignments that will actually work in an online or hybrid course? It's easy to use the lab manual in our face-to-face -face classes, but what do we do with the online and hybrid groups? And that's where finding people that understand technology and having them help me build these types of assignments. So matching assignments, fill in the blank, these types of things has been invaluable. So that's, just, that's an example of one resource. Let me share a few more. Uh, virtual microscopy. So obviously, uh, microscopy is a, is a complicated thing to do in, in hybrid and online classes. It's very easy to teach in the face-to-face -face environment. So I always try to, to create the best environment that I can, and putting together resources is very important. So if you have, if you have an online or hybrid class and, you, and they need to learn about the microscope, then I've been able to take and curate resources from, from all over and build a pretty good experience. So I, I actually, just a typical student in an online class learning about the microscope or histology, which is study of tissues, I would give them two virtual microscopes, one from the University of Delaware and then the virtual urchin microscope from the University of Washington, and then two histology, online histology atlases. You have the virtual histology lab and then University of Michigan has one as well. And I have students use that plus an 11 part microscopy tutorial video series where I walk them through the parts of the microscope and, and how to use it. And then I have them do their virtual labs and have them create virtual uh, lab manuals. So that's another example of how I've, I've been able to mix and match resources from all over the place and then add in what I need to, which is the tutorial videos where students can actually see me, see my hands, see me using the microscope and also see what's, what's on, the, in, in, on the field of view. Here's a microbiology lab, same thing. I've taken a few of their step-by-step -step labs and then I've added my own lab reports and, and combined them in different ways. So why video specifically, and then why share them publicly? I've, I've covered a few of those things, but I think that uh, video really is exploding. A lot of students are used to using videos. You know, there's billions of views on YouTube all the time. 
uh, video, video just seems to be a way that the majority of students uh, like to learn. So I, I've tried everything. I've, I've done a lot of written text. I've, done, I've created a lot of content that uses screen, screenshots. I've created audio content. And the overwhelming majority of students say that the video content is the, um, the most beneficial for them. So I'm, videos are hard to make, they're, they're time consuming to make, but I, but, I, but I make them because they, they seem to be valuable and the students like them. And I've already mentioned why I share them publicly. One of the, one of the beautiful things about, uh, about using open education resources and Creative Commons licensed resources is I can share the resources that I create publicly. Uh, actually, matter of fact, um, OpenStack re OpenStax reached out to me and we've, act we've developed a partnership where they've asked to know what kind of resources I would need to continue to make videos using their the OpenStax resources. And they are now part of their instructor uh, resource materials. We're, we're working on the, getting that finished up now. Um, yeah, so I'll come back. Molly, I, I have an obstacles uh, section here at the end and we, we can definitely talk about that. Well, I guess we can, we can talk about video specifically uh, right now. So with, yeah, with videos to make sure, to make sure that they're, uh, we're, we're, they're compliant. Um, all videos are closed captions. Now I, pers I personally start by using, I start by using YouTube's uh, captioning software, not very effective. So what I do, I actually make my videos using Camtasia. Then, um, so what I, what I do there is I can separate the audio file. I, I don't wanna to get too, too into the technical into the weeds, but I can separate the audio from the video and then I run that through my Dragon Dictation software. So again, this is, we're talking about hundreds of dollars of technology here in order to make these videos, which is why, which is why I, don't, I don't recommend that people start right out of the gate. I've been making videos for about a decade now and I've slowly in, improved my skills in those area. So if you, don't, if you don't want to worry about making your own reset resources compliant, then your best bet is to find some online, curate them that are already compliant. And so I do a combination of letting YouTube's uh, transcription software take a, take a crack at it, and then I use the Dragon Dictation software, and you still have to go through and kind of clean them up as you go along. And this will also tie into my section later on um, developing partnerships and relationships. So I actually have a couple of instructors that uh, use my videos in their courses and they wanted to pitch in. So one, one thing, that, one from Minnesota and one from uh, oh, somewhere on the East Coast, I can't remember. I've just met them both via email and, and social media. And what they do is they actually will help. They help me with the transcription and captioning of the videos as kind of payment for, for instead of them having to make their own resources. So where do we find these resources? I think that's, the, that's really the main thing that I wanted to talk about besides why we should build some of our own. Um, here's just a fun little picture. This is actually a urine simulator that was at the Science Center here in Sioux Falls where I live. That's my son playing a game about a, a, simula a simulation of urine. So resources can be everywhere if, if you know where to look. So when I first started to look for OER resources, because, because prior to that, I never even explored what was out there because I was using the publisher's resources and all their instructor resources. We have, you know, mastering AMP, mastering microbiology. We have all these, these, uh, these amazing resources out there. So I was just finding ways to use the resources that the publishers would share. So now, now when, when you have to go out and find all your own, it, it does take a lot of work. But the first place that I started was, was honestly just Googling. And I don't know if every, every topic is as well covered as some of the science topics out there, but there are there are a lot of really good resources. I, I like to say that I'm, I'm a deep Googler. So I would do, you know, Google and just continue to search and link from different things and just find some hidden gems that, that were already out there. Um, I can show you a list. Of, I'll show you a list in just a moment of some of the resources that, that I use and, and where I found them. Social media, I've already mentioned that that's, that's become a really big thing. I've been, I've been active on Twitter for years, but ever since, uh, since the pandemic, I've really gotten involved in a few uh, Facebook groups, and they have just been phenomenal for sharing resources. There's Facebook groups for biology instructors, AMP instructors. They're just uh, the pandemic pedagogy Facebook group is just for for all instructors. And I found that people have always been very, very giving and, and, and love to share their own their resources. But it seems even more so now. So I would say the first first place I start is just kind of to Google and find what's out there. Uh, and then secondly, I've been looking in social media, and you can even ask if, you, if you're looking for a specific resource, I just ask on Twitter, ask on Facebook and see what pops up. And then just personal connections. I know that uh, I've, had, uh, I've had resources shared with me that I didn't know about from colleagues at Western Iowa Tech, from 
from someone at Northeast Iowa Community College, uh, a friend that works at Dakota Wesleyan University found a really good resource that I use. So this kind of having connections and asking around has been another way that I've found a, a laundry list of resources that I can share with my students. Uh, so here's just an example. I still talk about online teaching, but it's the same. And, you know, these, these, are, these are examples of some of the hands-on activities that I have students do. So when, when, if I'm gonna build a course from scratch, there's a few things that I really like to make sure are in there. And I always, I always try to make sure that students have hands-on experience. Now with these, if I have students doing things, you know, we, we use safety contracts and, and these types of things. It's, it's a balancing act. I still teach some courses where students have to buy, you know, $250 kits that allow them to do some activities and, and some that are better than the ones that I can have students do for, for nothing or for next to nothing. And so I have, to, I have to balance that with the cost for students versus the experience they're gonna get. But these are all just examples of some of the types of activities that I can have students doing. I have them do them in the face-to-face -face class and, I, and I've had some students uh, do them outside of the class as well. So just, I don't wanna read through the whole list here, but the, the point is there's a lot of them. Uh, I'll share some of the resources from that, that I use here as well. Some are very simple, react, reaction time testing, students basically need a, a, a stopwatch and a ruler, things like that. A few of them, they need a, they need a handful of resources and we can get those for the students when they need them. Some of these are more complex. If, if, it is a, if it is an activity that requires a bit of cost and a lot of resources, I always, I always like to make those optional. Uh, I just let the students know it's something they can participate in and they can do, but I don't, I don't require them. This is just a list of some of the simulations that I use. Simulations are relatively easy to find, but the big issue, like, uh, you know, like I saw there in the chat, one thing right now is making sure that these are resources that are accessible to all students. And if they're not, so my work around there, because like Flash is a big issue. Chrome, you know, Chromebooks can't use Flash. Um, iOS devices can't use Flash. So now if I find a really good thing, and Flash is going away at the end of the year anyways. But when I, if I find a good resource that uses Flash, what I will do, I used to have the students do them, but there were just too many hurdles. There were students that were struggling and students that couldn't use them. And I, and I wanted to try to find a way that was fair and accessible to everyone. So what I do now with a Flash-based simulation is I will actually, I do recordings of me going through the simulation. And rather, so now I don't think it's as good as having students do it and learn and use, you know, trial and error. But since they weren't accessible before, I can make them accessible by me running through the simulations. I even make mistakes on purpose and, and, and show them where the mistakes would be and why it was a mistake. So I feel like the, the downside of them not getting to physically do the simulation is made up for by the fact that I that I show them the teaching moments and I teach them as I go through it. So that's another example of how I've tried to make things more accessible. It's way easier for me to make a simulation accessible by having a, a recording option than it is to actually make, a, I can't, well I can't, I can't make a simulation that's not mine, um, switch from Flash to HTML or those types of things. But it's on here, just you know, tons of examples of things that I use in anatomy, microbiology, nutrition, all over the place. And, the, and then some of the, these are the ones that, if there were any accessibility issues, those are the ones that I made recordings to, to replace. I'm right, just gonna run through a few more of the, of the resources that I use. I can, like I said, I'll send out a link to uh, uh, a blog post I wrote last year that had 54 different resources on it. Here's, uh, so as far as hands-on activities, I, I actually reached out to the instructors that made these soda bottle a &P activities at Ohio Northern U University, and they were completely fine with me sharing the resources anywhere. So I have students, uh, I think there's five different simulations that students can use there that take, take very limited resources. We're working on ways to, to build little lab kits that students, that students can get for a much lower cost than, than the competitors, which we still use in some of our classes. So that's one good example of something that I've been able to find that students have really loved. Um, HHMI is great. The Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, I use this for all of my classes. These, uh, the not, these are not. These do not require flash, so these are much easier to use for the students, and they can be on used, used on all devices. So that's HHMI. Uh, PHET is another really good one. They're slowly converting their resources from flash to HTML, and they have a ton of good resources there. Like I said, I don't want, I don't want to go through everything they have because I'm just going to share the list. I'm just going to share the list later. Uh, the Merlot, Merlot collection is another place where I go, one of the first places I go to, I'm looking for resources. As you can see here, there are, I, there are over 5,000, almost 6,000 different simulations, and you can specifically find ones that are Creative Commons licensed, so you can use and share them uh, in any way you see fit. 
online dissection, another area where I've used a combination of, you know, finding really good and accessible resources that are out there. If I can't, then I just, I just make videos and I do video-based resources on instead. So there's uh, several, the National Anti-Vivisection Society, uh, PETA, they both have some resources. There's also the two main resources that I use, the University of Wisconsin, their School of Medicine has a complete um, human, you know, human cadaver dissection. I believe it's 22 hours worth, worth of video resources. So what I'll do there is I take, I take sections, and they've given us permission to do this. I take sections of their videos, and then I can actually create quizzes using either screenshots or using a tool like Edpuzzle that allows you to embed quizzes on top of videos. So I've been able to use the, the gross anatomy dissection there. We'd never be able to do that at the school that I you know, teach at face-to-face. -face. So it's, it's the closest we can get to a gross anatomy dissection. And then for the fetal pig, I use the one from um, Whitman College, has a great, a great uh, virtual fetal pig dissection that also doesn't require flat or anything. It's just it's image-based. Uh, chem I don't teach chemistry, but, uh, but obviously biochemistry is a huge part of the classes that I teach. So I do use some resources from the American Chemical Society. Who else did I put on here? So case studies. I've talked about you know using a lot of simulations, and with simulation simulations really allow me to build a course where the students get to experience things that they wouldn't be able to even in a face-to-face -face class because of cost. The other benefit of using simulations in in classes like mine is that um, student it, it shortens the learning curve. Students can can do simulations multiple times, and they, they don't have to worry about prep, clean up those types of things. So so I've always liked simulations. And then I've talked a little bit about you know, using hands-on activities. I think it's important that students are physically doing things whenever possible. The third big thing that I like to build into my courses, besides just the basic uh, teaching content, are case studies. I think case studies are super important. They allow the students to apply what they're learning in, in a real-world experience, real world experience. I create case studies. I have students create case studies. But if I'm looking to curate or find them, I go here to the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science. So I, I, I really like a lot of their case studies. I may change them and adapt them depend, depending, on, depending on my needs, but that's, usually, that's one of the places that I go to for first. So I know if you don't teach science that these specific resources don't matter. I just wanna show you the, you know, the level and depth of resources that are out there and ways that you can hopefully find them and use them for yourself. A couple more hands-on activities, just different ones, an egg protein lab, DNA extraction lab from, from learning genetics there in Utah. Uh, here's a busy bones activity that I have nutrition students do and, and AMP1 students sometimes as far as to show the proteins and mineralization of bones. Okay, so I've talked about why I like to build courses that utilize a lot of these resources. I still haven't talked about all the downsides yet. I've talked about how to find these, the, these types of resources. And another way that you find resources and get these, get these resources built is to develop relationships and partnerships. So this is certainly, I, I have had a lot of help in putting together resources and creating resources and finding resources from all over the place. Uh, the first thing I'd recommend doing is, you know, reaching out to the, to the publishers. So, you know, like OpenStax, for example, they reached out to me, but I've developed quite a relationship with them. If, they're, if there's a topic that I don't think their textbooks have covered well enough, then I can directly reach out to them and let them know that. If there are resources that are missing, then uh, I do the same thing. But there's also a community of people. So if, if you want to use, for example, if you want to use an OpenStax textbook, then find the communities that are out there of other instructors using, using OpenStax textbooks. That's how I've found quite a few resources. People are sharing the worksheets and assignments that they're building with using those same resources you are. So if you're both using the same textbook and they're creating a good resource, then why not get it from them? So reaching out to the publishers directly, but then also finding other instructors that are using the same resources. I put colleagues on here, so that's not, not just other instructors using OpenStax, but I've, but I've shared resources and received resources from colleagues all over the place, just developing relationships there. Strangers, like, like I said before, um, social media has become a place where you can, you can ask and you can receive all sorts of different resources that are out there, and especially, especially now more than ever. And then I do, I do want to talk about how important it is if a, if a school or a consortium like the ICCOC is really interested in OER, then, then there has to be an, an investment and we, and we have to make uh, develop partnerships across the entire school. So I want to just share a couple things that um, a couple things that have happened at uh, Western Iowa Tech, where, where, I, where I teach full time. 
um, you know, we're, we're trying to make this a bigger and bigger deal. Buy, buy-in has been slow, but in order to, in order to uh, make things run a little more slo- smoothly, a couple things have happened. Uh, Western Iowa Tech has actually built now a recording studio. So if people are going to be creating audio or video resources, we, n- we now have a place where a place where that can happen. So it's, it, it's full of all the technology you would need. Um, it's kind of BY, BYOL, I guess, bring your own laptop. But I think they're, they're working on getting one in there that even has editing software. But it's a start because uh, if, people, if people are concerned about creating resources, then time, you know, time and the energy it takes are going are gonna to be big hurdles. But after that, location, you know, finding a quiet place to record has always been a big problem. Prior to this recording studio at Western Iowa Tech, you'd just see people hiding off in corners with, uh, with notes, on the, notes on the door to, you know, be quiet because they're recording. So that is one less hurdle that the typical instructor has to deal with. The other thing happening at Western Iowa Tech has to do with accessibility. Uh, so we're now working on getting, we've already been given permission, we just haven't found the students, but getting uh, work-study students that are going to be helping to make sure that any resources we create are, are ADA compliant and accessible. So that's probably going to involve mainly, you know, formatting and closed captioning transcripts, those types of things, but I think that's going to be a big help. So the, to me, the college is making it clear that they want instructors to make resources and make their courses better, and they're trying to invest at least in those ways. So I would love to hear what, uh, what's happening at any other school. That, that would be great. Those are some of the, the partnerships that I think need to be developed if you're going, if you're going to go out and, and find all this content and basically build your courses, not from scratch, because you can find the textbooks to work with, but these ancillary resources are just super important. So obstacles, What's, what has slowed me down in the past, what continues to slow me down, what might, what might keep an instructor from, from building courses rather than using uh, publisher resources. Time is the big one, and I can't, you know, that's why I tell, I, I tell friends or, or colleagues that are considering uh, starting to make a lot of their own resources or even find resources to go, to go with open educational resources. It's going to take some time. I don't, I don't actually know, uh, I, I wouldn't expect the average person to spend as much time as I do on it in, in a given week, but it is going to take time. So whether it's, you know, two hours a week or half a day a week where you're out there finding and building resources, it, that's just that that is going to be one of the biggest hurdles the time and energy it takes especially now i know that we're all you know we're just keeping our heads above water even what i do i've, I've slowed my progress about 50 percent this semester just because i'm spending way more time helping students deal with technology because they're taking hybrid or online courses that they normally wouldn't take um, you know dealing with with scheduling and, and building new resources because only half my students give me in the classroom at the time i'm you know answering emails so there's there's so much else on my plate this semester compared to a normal fall that I just have to I have to slow down a little bit and that's okay. Uh, creating alternative assignments. So I put Flash in there because that's a, that's such a, a glaring example right now. I mean Flash Flash is going away, but even before that there were so so many students that couldn't use Flash. So when if I find a, a simulation or an assignment that I think is great but it's just not accessible, then I'll do whatever I can to to make it accessible. If it's written word, I can just I can change the format. I'll, I'll pull the text out and put it in something that will be compliant and accessible. If it's something like a simulation like Flash, I've just re- reverted to uh, resorted to uh, making the videos like I mentioned earlier and then making them compliant. Another obstacle is buy-in from colleagues. So this this is a big deal when when you don't have you know you you don't have the final say in what resources you use. So uh, like what you know with with the consortium with the ICCOC. Different schools have, have, have the power to say what textbooks and resources are used in different courses. So I, so I might teach a course where I have, I have no say in, in, in what resources are being used. Um, even at, you know, at Western Iowa Tech, I, I'm not the only instructor that teaches A&P courses. So I have, uh, and this is nothing against anyone, just, just sharing the experience. I have, I have a full um, OER anatomy and physiology course ready to go. And I use tons of those resources in my class, but I don't have the final say in, in what textbook is used in, in our courses. So there's a group of us that have that decision. So I, um, I wasn't able to use it. So, my, so I'm, still, I'm still teaching a course out of a textbook that technically wouldn't be needed in, in my courses because I, ha- I have the resources available and created to, to move to, op- to, to an OpenStax textbook. But I was not able to do that. So maybe next fall I will, maybe we'll run it as a pilot or something like that. But getting buy-in from colleagues is is a huge is a huge deal. It has to be done. 
I had the I had the luxury, uh, you know, Western Iowa Tech. I'm the only microbiology instructor, so the nice thing about that was there wasn't there wasn't any objections when I decide, decided to move to Open Education Resources. So now, um, the microbiology course is is completely OER, but anatomy we're just just waiting for to see what happens as far as if they get the other colleagues to um, jump ship with me or if they allow me to to teach with my own resources. We'll see. Accessibility is, is a huge deal, you know, like, like Molly mentioned, I mean, every resource that we use, uh, we need to make sure that all students are able to access it. I think I've given a few examples there. And lastly, I just, just as I was going through this morning, I did add safety because anytime you're asking a student to do something, there, there are potential safety concerns, not with using their computer, but uh, that's the one, the, one of the biggest things that I thought about when I started to add, add hands-on activities to my courses was making sure students were safe. And so we do, I do utilize a safety contract, uh, but then also if there's any safety concerns with any, with any sort of activity, I just don't use it. Uh, so I, I find, the, I find the, best, the best activities I can that I feel like keep my students uh, completely safe. So at the end here, I just wanna talk about the results, what I've seen uh, with both student experiences and cost savings, and then uh, open it up to any questions anyone has. So as far as cost, it's kind of hard for me, kind of hard for me to tell exactly because I have some some classes where the students aren't spending any money. I have some classes where I've been able to get rid of uh, the textbook cost, but not the lab manual cost. Uh, I have I have some that's the opposite that the students still pay for the textbook, but not the lab manual. But by running the numbers, I'm I'm definitely over over 100,000 in cost savings. Now that's assuming every student bought every resource at at full cost but I've only been working on these types of resources for about three years. So I'd say in three years, I've been able to, uh, to save students, just you know, one instructor been able to save students uh, six figures, a little, little over 100,000 is my, is my uh, calculation, but of course that, that's assuming what I just mentioned, that no one's renting or buying used books, but still it's, it's a big number. It's at least half of that, I would say. So massive cost savings. And then the students, yeah, students are just, they're just ecstatic when they, when they see that the, the costs of the course have come down. And then also the, the number of resources that I add to try to, to try to create a better learning experience. And the courses I teach, taught, taught a few years ago were pretty good, but the courses that I teach now are just so much better. The con and, and it all has to do with the fact that I went out and found or created resources that the students need. So now if you look if you look at a typical course now the students get much more uh, you know teaching from me because because of the the teaching and lecture videos but then also the different types of activities they're always doing different things always learning new things the student student satisfaction has definitely gone up and part of it is because the course is cheaper but i also think that they they find that the course is better i would say the most uh, the last point i put there on family involvement the most common positive feedback that i now get from courses Besides, you know, them greatly appreciating that I respect um, how expensive an education is by, by trying to keep costs low. The most common positive feedback that I get is students love that they can do these kinds of activities and they can, and they can involve their family. Whether it's an online class or a face-to-face -face class where I have them doing activities at home, they love that their families can get more involved in their learning. Right, they they have students that are that are watching the video. They have, they have kids with, that are watching the videos with them. Kids doing some of the activities with them, and they just love it. So the kid, so their children are using their simulations after they do them, et cetera, et cetera. And I get, and I've had students just constantly talking about that, how they get to show their kids how important an education is by having you know doing it with them, and and that they could never bring their kids into the classroom. They could never bring their kids into the lab, but we're able to we're able to do that on the other end. So just these are some pictures these students allowed me to share these just to show just some students doing some different activities that I have them doing in some of their courses. So I think uh, then as far as the future, I'd really just rather more have a conversation with you. But um, what I'm working on personally is definitely increasing the technology. So I'm, I'm, I have the nervous system left and then I'm, 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 done, I'm done creating videos for my microbiology and anatomy and physiology courses. So I should be done within a month, maybe five weeks. My next goal is to go, you know, to go back through and make sure that everything is absolutely as accessible as possible. But then I want to start to, to create more assignments. I'm not sure I'll ever have the technology, uh, the capabilities to, um, to create simulations. But I want to work, you know, work with some friends that I've developed, you know, friendships I've developed along the way, and maybe create the content that someone else can put together in simulations. So I'd like to create some of my own resources like that. And definitely creating, my ultimate goal is to be able to create, uh, to recreate some of the publisher content that's missing with open education resources. 
like I think about you know mastering A and P and learn smart these types of things. Can we create some of these more of these matching assignments, fill in the blank assign, assignments, animations? Can we continue to create more and more of these resources? So that's going to be where my energy is going in the next couple of years. As far as OER in general, you know my my personal opinion is that it's continue it's going to continue to grow as more and more schools look for ways to save their student save their students money. And I hope that as it continues to grow, the quality continues to improve. I, I know that OpenStax is making new editions of their books. They're, they're improving on some of their older, uh, their older um, images, these types of things. So I see this continuous improvement in quality happening. Um, I also see that there are third parties that are trying to get more and more involved. So maybe there, maybe there won't be, you know, maybe like Loom and Learning and these types of things. Maybe there won't be a need for me to create all of these ancillary resources because someone's going to come along and create a low cost alternative where if you're if you're already using the OpenStax textbooks, here's all the resources you could ever need. And it's still at a low cost. Now, not free, not not no cost, but still at still at a relatively low cost. Okay, uh, I think that's that's the sh my spiel and, and what I wanted to to say. So well, thank should you we open up for questions? Incredibly yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I do, if, if nobody else does. Um, so it's Molly. How do you ensure that there's then consistency, especially in things like A and P and science disciplines? We see a lot of synonyms and moving back and forth, and that just sort of leads to confusion. Um, and then second, don't students get really overwhelmed by having all these other resources to go to instead of like one place to go study? Well, I think that's why, yeah, the, that's why I think that's why the course design is so important. Like, so I might have a course that's using, that has resources all over the place, but they're just working one link, you know, one link at, at a time through their modules. And that's the same whether we're using OER or not. Like I teach, I teach a course using uh, MindTap resources with the, with the Cengage Unlimited program. And it's the same thing. I have them jumping around in the textbook and I have them doing multiple different assignment types. But to them, as long as they go through Canvas, which is where the course is built, they're going a line at a time. So I think it's, it is very important. I think that's, that's, a, that's a critical point. It's very important that, you, that your course shell itself is organized in a way where navigation is easy for the students. Because yeah, in, in a single chapter module, they might be going to five different locations, but they could barely notice that because all I'm asking them to do is start at the start here section in a module and then go maybe a link to the textbook, a link to a written document, a link to a simulation, a link to a case study, but they just continue, they just know that they continue to have to come back to, to the course shell. I think, I think that's, that's very important. Uh, is there still confusion? Yeah, and, and I think that's where, you know, it always just takes listening to student back, uh, students' feedback and then making corrections. Like with, uh, with this mind tap, this is a brand new thing for me this semester. And there were students that were getting themselves in trouble because they would, they would go to mind tap, which is, again, the Cengage product, and then they would just continue to navigate through there, and they were completely getting lost. I had, that, just, that really just took a reminder, an email, like it's super important, do, do what I send you, close out, come back and, and do it again. And I think that that trial and error and just learning where students are gonna have issues is, is just a, a part of building courses. I think that uh, my, you know, when I first build a course, I have no idea where the students are gonna struggle. It is, it is so important to listen, to listen to students and, and rebuild the courses based on their feedback. I think that's honestly um, how all my courses have been built, is just if students really like something and are getting a lot of value out of it, then I do more of it. If, they're, if they don't like something and it's not working, I do less of it. And you know, I, I can give examples uh, with video. Right when I, when I first started making videos, my plan was to make, um, basically I had my gallbladder out and I was sitting at home you know, kind of buzzed up on pain medication, but I couldn't, I couldn't go to work. So uh, I started creating some super simple videos, just using the iPad, you know, the microphone from the iPad, the quality was terrible, but I was just basically trying to, to create some videos to recreate the lectures they were missing while I was gone. And the feedback was so good that I continued to make videos, but my ultimate goal was still just to make a couple, you know, two or three videos per unit. Here's the most critically important stuff, kind of like the, maybe the crash course videos on YouTube. 
uh, but the fee but the students were liking them. They were getting more and more out of them. So I just continued to do it. And then the, the quantity and quality improved over time. But there have been plenty of things that I've done that have been that have been complete duds, and I and I just re removed them. So yeah, if something is too confusing, then I then I either try to find a way to make it more organized or, and less confusing, <clears throat> or just cut it out. Yeah, as far as like terminology and those types of things, I mean that's that's a huge struggle whether we're using. OER or not, you know, I look at the, uh, the anatomy textbooks, the, especially the one that we use for the Pearson, every edition, they basically change which, 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 um, which terms are most important. And I think they do that because, you know, in order to make a new edition of a textbook, you have to, what, change 10% of the content. So you've got, um, I'm trying to think of an example, but, uh, uh, but you've got in one edition of the textbook, they, they're using this term or bolding this term specifically, highlighting this term in the next edition, they've changed it. So I think, yeah, that's just the, the problem of, you know, both of us having to teach courses where we're not speaking English, right? We're, you know, we're speaking a combination of, of Latin and Greek and that, that, and then not to mention that during this transition time where people have to know the old terminology that we learned, you know, but, but then all the new ter terminology because they're removing eponyms, I think that's just, just kind of part of it. <clears throat> what, else, what else did you ask, I'm sorry? Oh. Frank, it's Gretchen. Can you hear me? Yep. I'd like to hear, not right now, but a plan from you on how we do this across the six colleges. Have you been in conversation with Lynn on microbiology? Because there are only two of you teaching that where there are a dozen people teaching A and P. It's just a thought and maybe that's- Oh no, yeah, I'm sure. No, I, I do. Yeah, I feel like, um, and then with, you know, Lynn, Lynn's working on, um, you know, we're, we're removing, you know, starting in the spring. So we're already making a step in that direction, right? Because starting yeah. in the spring, the e-science lab, lab kit will be gone. So that's going to save, well, how many, how many hundreds of students are going to save $250? Like it's, uh, it's from, a, from a cost savings, that's just going to be amazing. So if, for those of you who don't know, we're talking about the, uh, the online microbiology course through the consortium uses the e-science lab kit. And, and, it, and it was a very good kit, but uh, there have been some pretty major issues over the last three semesters that have made us look in a different direction. But the nice thing is we can we can either eliminate that cost or greatly reduce it. So we, I've been in, I've been in conversations with another third party about trying to make a make a lab kit that uh, that gets us most of the same functionality, but might cost the students fifty dollars. So and Lynn and I have been in talk, talks about that. So whether we just, whether we just reduce the cost or completely eliminate it, uh, that would be great. But yeah, no, I, I'm on, I'm 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 more than willing to share anything I've done, and I'm looking for as many partners as possible to. To continue to make resources better, and, uh, and but that is that's going to take a lot of buy-in. But but I do agree that's where you should start. Start like like I said, I started at Western Iowa Tech with microbiology because nobody cared as long as I was put, you know making good courses. Nobody cared what changes I made because I was the only instructor this, after Rod retired. And then um, and then uh, at the consortium level, I compl I completely agree. We should start with the class the the class that has the the fewest instructors because it'll be easier to get get the buy-in that we need. I'm not trying to make anyone make courses like me. I'm not trying to make anyone use my resources. That's why with the example I shared at Western Iowa Tech, I have, there's no hard feelings about that. Like if they're, if they're not on board and I can't, I can't uh, use the course the way that I want to right now, then that's just how it's going to be. I'll continue to slowly try to, to win them over. But if not, uh, and the college doesn't allow me to run some sort of a pilot program, then and that it is what it is at this point. Thanks for that, Frank. I had a couple questions, um, just very sort of <laughs> specific ones. Um, my first one is, um, is there a way that your institution marks courses where the cost is free to students? I mean, is there like a place where students can find that out when they're registering for classes if they won't be required to buy a textbook? Um. <laughs> Yeah, the the uh, the I know at Western Iowa Tech, at least with that switch to the microbiology, the advisors, the advisors are the one that know that it's it's in the course description, but uh, that and that's that therein lies the problem. I, I do think in the future, if we start to see more instructors kind of taking their own path, then I do think that it's going to take some some uh, some work on that end because right that's the issue right now. Mm -hmm. If a student signed up to take a uh, an A and P class with me at Western Iowa Tech. It would say they need the textbook, and the library would tell them the textbook, whether whether that's true or not. So I think it will take some some personalization if if we're if we're going to go that direction. But for now, that's you know at least at least at Western Iowa Tech, that's what that's what I see and that's what I know. 
Thanks. And then so I mainly, I mean, sorry, I just, I mainly instruct the advisors on what I want, what I want the students to know. But you know, the problem with that is so many students are not using advisors and registering themselves. So that, that's a problem too. I definitely, we definitely have issues. So that involves, you know, again, involves communication. I reach out to the students uh, at the, at the, you know, uh, before the, well before the semester begins to let them know if the, you know, if there's any confusion about what resources they might need or not need. And then right when the course starts as well. So I've certain, certainly had problems there. Yeah, we had kind of run into similar problems too, where our database for collecting textbook information for students is sort of meant for commercial textbooks. And so it's very hard for faculty to sort of report um, al sort of alternative resources, I guess. Um, yeah. yeah. But I saw Dan, can I, or, or go ahead, but I saw that uh, Dan asked a question, but- oh, um, yeah. go ahead with Dan. Let's ask, answer Dan's question first. All right, so the low cost alternative for wrapper software and tech you can't recreate seems like a good option. Um, how would I personally define low cost? That's, that's actually, I don't know if I really thought about that. So when I, when I talk about cost um, with students, I'm generally comparing it to what the course cost. Now my, my, my goal, my, when, when, I, when I say low cost though, or my ultimate goal is to make it so that a student can take an entire course for under $50. That, that's the number in my head. But if I get a course from, so with the microbiology course that Gretchen and I were talking about, if we get the cost, because right now they buy, they buy the textbook, they buy the Mastering Microbiology Access, and then they buy this 230 some dollar um, lab kit. So if I get the cost of that course from 500 to 250, I, I still consider that a huge win, and I would, you know, I would basically compare the, to compare the costs for the students. But my ultimate goal, uh, personally, is to try to get every course to be under $50. Now, in order to do that, uh, so, many, so many things have to be done. Um, like I said, I think we need, I think we, I, I need help, you know, in my areas anyways, I need help or some third party needs to step in that can create really robust resources. I can create videos and create written documents and, and I can create some pretty simple quizzes uh, um, using these, these, quote, these Creative Commons images, but I can't, you know, I don't know, I, I can't take it to that next level. And that's what, that's what Mastering AMP, Mastering Microbiology, those third party publishers, they have amazing resources. So someone's gonna have to step in um, or else we'll have to create them one at a time. And, it's, and at some point, uh, I feel like if we've if created enough good resources where we can remove those third parties, then, then that'll help the cost really shoot down. The other issue though, and this is, this is part of the problem, I guess, with being a bit of a, of a trailblazer in different areas, is um, low, low cost really should mean nothing out of pocket for students, right? Because some students would rather some students would rather pay, you know, rather have a $250 lab kit that they were able to use their, you know, Pell Grant money or, or student loans on than pay $50 out of pocket. So that, and that's why, that's why when I create, you know, I guess I should have mentioned this earlier, but when I have, when I have different assignments for students that, that can have a cost, I always, I, I tell them, you know, I always have a zero cost option. So I, I have optional activities that students can do that would cost, you know, like I have students, I've had students like build microscopes. They'd have, they have to go to the hardware store and do this and do that. And they can certainly, they can use that type of assignment, but I can't force everyone um, to, to go and spend that kind of money, right? I've had students that have actually, you know, bought things on Amazon so they can grow microbes and do different things. And that's great, but I can't make them. So I have to assume that a student doesn't have any money. Uh, so, so that I think that so so low cost. If we're talking about students using loans and using using financial aid, is a different number than low cost. If you were asking students to buy stuff, so that's kind of a roundabout answer. But does, does it actually answer your question? Yeah, I turned my mic. Okay. I'm I'm actually a, a math teacher at DMAC, but um, we've been obviously digging this for a long time, and we do. We've started going down that course fee model, so it's built in. Um, if we could get rid of the bookstores cut, <laughs> we could even get that cost, like you say, under $50, and I teach statistics for all the mastering and everything. So nice. um, the nice thing is these OER things are really pushing the cost down for everybody, which is beautiful. And these foundations are starting to create softwares and simulations that are excellent. So I applaud you for all your efforts and your pursuit of this and um, yeah it's 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 a great thing so thank you for for doing this today yeah yeah open yeah OpenStax actually offered to give me some money and I said no I said keep using it to keep making better and better resources I, I want you know in the end I want um, I want the quality to be equivalent whether whether you went with a uh, 
a traditional publisher or something like OpenStax. And I know OpenStax doesn't offer, you know, it's not, not the answer for all, for all disciplines. But for me, that's what, you know, I, I keep, I just want OpenStax to keep doing what they're doing better. And that's going to make my life easier and everyone that teaches in my areas better. Um, yeah, I think that's the answer. Again, that's why I can't, I have, I'm limited to what I can do right now, but you know, I'm glad like Gretchen's here today. So, you know, maybe we can make a push at the even consortium level to do some of these things, but I can't see, I can't create, uh, you know, uh, my ultimate goal is to create lab kits that students can buy that are very low cost and they can buy, they can get them right, right from the bookstore. But until I get, until I get buy-in across, across a group, whether it be me and Lynn with the consortium's online microbiology course, or whether it be me and the other anatomy instructors at Western Iowa Tech, these are just things that, that, that the college is not willing to, um, you know, deal with inventory and all this type of stuff unless, unless, it, unless it gets more buy-in. It is just so important to get buy-in in terms of pretty much any aspect of OER development, um, which leads me to a, a question about kind of programmatic support at, um, at your institution. So you did mention that it's kind of, there needs to be an investment from the institution. And does, um, does your institution have sort of like grants or anything that they offer to faculty or, or sort of professional development opportunities around OER that, that folks who maybe don't know much about it could learn more? Uh, we pretty much we've taken it upon ourselves. You know, you look at no. So there's that. Uh, now there are you know people are people are paid for developing master courses, but there's nothing about OER. And right you know right now there's a big pit push for um, Cengage Unlimited and different things. So no, I would I mean I would like to see um, every school uh, put you know invest more in OER. But uh, but as of right now uh, there the uh, we did, we, you know, like I said, at Western Iowa Tech, we did, we did get the recording studio. That was great. They, you know, they, they I just put together a wish list and they, and they approved it. I was, I was, it, that was awesome. The buy-in with the work study is a huge deal because recording a video is, you now that's frustrating and, and frustrating and, and tr stressful for some people, but recording a video takes a lot less time, especially once you have some practice than it does to, uh, to do the captionings and all that. And I, I mean, I, that's why I have a, I've uh, I've paid for technology to help me because it, it takes so much time. So I think that they've they've given us a space and they've given us some time, you know, some time back by getting some help from students. But other than that, no. Like for yeah, for I I didn't I don't I wasn't paid anything to to rebuild my courses. I'm not paid anything to create the resources I create. So um, and yeah, I I mean I, I'm. Per, you know, I'd like to see, I'd like to see even more buy-in, that's for sure. But that's why I'm so excited about this group. You know, when I first heard, heard about it, I heard about it from, uh, you know, Gretchen and, and Teresa at the consortium and my friend Kyle from Northeast Iowa Community College. I'm like, this is great because if we get more buy-in at the, at the state level, I think it's definitely going to trickle down uh, to, to all the individual schools. Absolutely. But, but just to like to reiterate, reiterate, like I've given presentations on on this. I'm giving a presentation in October on how to how to how to do YouTube videos at the you know not this last year, but the two ICOC conferences before that. I gave presentations on on make you know making video and again the things that I that I kind of highlight. So uh, yeah, you're seeing it out there, but it's volunteer work. We'll put it that way. I'm a dean. I wish I had money to give for it. It would be I, I, my I, dream. Yeah. It would be my dream, but we're community <laughs> colleges. We don't have those resources. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, many institutions do not, which, which does sort of like halt, I think, or just slow down the development of, of OER yeah. somewhat. But it's great to see such a grassroots um, sort of, you know, movement forming in Iowa. I mean, there, there are a lot of professors who are doing this work, and it's great to see that you're reaching out within your disciplines, too. Um, when you're searching for, for OER to use in your class, are you searching specifically for openly licensed resources or are you kind of looking for just the best thing that you can find regardless of licensing? And then if you find that something is not openly licensed, do you sort of like just reach out to the, the creator and say, look, can I use this? Yeah, I'd say the answer is probably both, right? If I can, if I start with something that is creatively commons licensed and openly licensed, that's awesome. So when I find those things, they certainly, that'd be a tiebreaker for sure. But um, no, I also just look for awesome resources. And, and if they're out there, like I said, I've reached out to, um, I've reached out to half a dozen different places and uh, the Nobel Prize website, they had a really good blood typing simulation. So I reached out to them to make sure that I could do whatever I wanted with it. 
Um, I showed earlier the, the, the soda lab activities. I actually found that reading, in, reading a journal article uh, from the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society. I reached out. I don't think I've ever had anybody say no, though. So, yeah, so I, I personally, I, would, I, I look, and, and like I showed with that Merlot site, you can look for things that specifically are, are, are CC licensed. But I also, if I just come across something cool, I, I try to get permission to use it and try to get permission to adapt it as needed. So yeah, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head with both, both of those answers are right. That's great, it's really great. A lot of times when we're working with people you know, to try to find OER, we, we ask them to sort of start in the repositories like Merlot or OER Commons or OTL or something like that. And they'll, they'll say, well, you know, there's nothing really here for me. I have to create something from scratch. But I think this, this idea that you can actually reach out to people who've created content that may not be openly licensed and ask them for permission is, is uh, something that people tend to overlook maybe sometimes. I think I think people would be blown away if they went on Facebook right now. Like, uh, and I don't go to Facebook uh, for anything else, but because it's a nightmare right now. But uh, but as far as the Facebook groups, so like the National Association of of Anatomy and Physiology Teachers, National Association of Biology Instructors, and a lot of them are K twelve. So, but but still, uh, I've just found that they they've actually when, when people share resources there, they also they also deposit them in a file system. So there are some Facebook groups out there that have just a treasure trove of, of resources already sitting out there. Like again, I'm saying he teaches math. I'm, I'd have to assume that there are math instructors gathering on, on Facebook in these groups that are, that are sharing their resources. So, so I think that, yeah, personally, if I'm looking for something right now, after I kind of do my own searching and ask my, my, my personal, my friends, then I just go straight to a Facebook group. Does anybody have a resource about this, right? The kidney or, or whatever. And Someone might share something right there. They might reach out to you. They might tell you that to already look in the file system that's already there because it's already been shared. Or you can just even search through these groups. I've just found, um, so yeah, like Merlot and OER Commons are great places, but I'm just amazed at what I found by doing the search function in Facebook groups nowadays. I mean, most people are, if they make resources, they're proud of them, right? I mean, and then, so I think it get, people get a huge kick out of the fact that, that other instructors want to share their resources. Yep, I, I email back and forth with a guy um, that we've actually become really good friends. And um, because he, he, he was making some videos and he, de he decided that he wanted to use some of mine instead. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy when I hear that, when an instructor says that the, 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 the teaching I'm doing on my videos is good enough that they'll share it with their students. So I think most people are like that. Most people are very willing to share. That's great to hear. Well, it looks like we're about at time. So, um, Unless anybody has any questions, I think we can wrap up. Um, Frank, I'd like to say thank you for, for joining us today. It was a really informative talk, and I think we all learned quite a bit about, um, about your process and about how one can go about um, finding resources for a course that don't cost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the last thing I want to say then is just don't, you know, no one should compare uh, their beginning to where I'm at, right? I mean, I've been doing, I've been doing this for years. Um, and, and like I said to Molly earlier, like I've failed so many times, like, you know, I look back even two years ago and kind of cringe at my courses. And, and even then they were, they were, you know, the students thought they were really good courses, but we all, we all should do that. As long as we're, as long as we're trying new things and learning from our mistakes and learning from student feedback, that's so super, super important. Like if you're going to be making these huge changes to your courses, the, the best advice I can give you is to ask your students how it's going beg them for feedback. You know, I mean, I look at like, you know, course evaluations, I read all the submission comments, I, I'm constantly begging the students to give me feedback, because that's the only way we're going to know if what we're working is, is what we're doing is, is working, right? I, I flat out asked the students this summer, because we were having some issues, like, do you want, do you want me to put, to put together some resources that we can use that will cost you $60? And I just, you know, flat out asked, and over the overwhelming answer was no. And I, and I, and and, and maybe I didn't go about it the right way, but um, yeah, almost every conversation I've had with students is that the the lower cost the better, but we still have to balance that with making sure it's a really good quality course too. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week, and um, stay tuned for next month. We don't have a speaker lined up yet, but I'm sure we will. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.